a real healer is someone who listens and who makes someone feel um, like they've been heard, you appropriately touch, you know, you make eye contact. We live in such a disconnected world, especially, you know, you look at the online stuff and social media and everybody's faces in their phone that when we connect in my exam room, that's very healing. <laughs>
it was a really tough time. I remember being at the gym, and at the time it was the elliptical machine, and what would I turn to in the newspaper when we still read newspapers? Um, I would, every day I would open the obituary page to see which friend had died. And I'm thinking, I'm in my 20s, shouldn't this happen when I'm in my 80s? Yeah. But you know, it was like I was looking through life through an old man's eyes. Uh, the flip side of the story is, and this has sort of become the theme of my life and it's how I was raised by my father, is um, I got more from giving to these people than they got from me helping to treat them and usher them onto the, you know, the next dimension. And it's interesting, I got very good at uh, death and dying, so whenever anybody in my family is kind of nearing the end of life, I get the call. So Yeah. Well, and then flipping to today, your practice has made a major transition because the way that you were practicing back then has really evolved. Yes. And you've developed a, a, a kind of a whole new image and everything. Why don't you talk about how you practice today and you know and what it is that you're actually doing as a physician? Sure. Because the way you practice is really unique and novel um, compared to how I know a lot of other you know physicians are practicing. Well, what happened was back in 2004, um, I realized that HIV was going to become a chronic manageable disease, and I didn't have to just focus on that. I loved internal medicine, all the you know stuff, and I wanted to basically see a broad variety of patients. Just so happened that a couple of the Doc Hollywoods, because I'm in Ground Zero of Beverly Hills, um, were opening up a new diagnostic center, and they asked me to join them. So I did, and what we did was we put together something where we've got X-ray laboratory, we've got colonoscopy, bone density, um, nuclear stress testing, basically everything you need for internal medicine right in my office. I learned over time the most important thing, the, the most precious commodity in medicine these days is time. And what's happened in medicine is unfortunate, which is they've kind of turned it into a high volume, low margin kind of uh, industry, and so it's a business. And so you basically get six minutes to see your doc out the door. Well, I anger a lot of my colleagues when I say what I'm about to say, which is, you know, a well-trained chimpanzee can probably throw prescriptions at a patient, but a real healer is someone who listens and who makes someone feel um, like they've been heard, you appropriately touch, you know, you make eye contact, we live in such a disconnected world, especially, you know, you look at the online stuff and social media and everybody's faces in their phone that when we connect in my exam room, that's very healing. And they've been hurt. So I may not have fixed their underlying issue when they walk out, but they always say they feel better, and that's my goal. What do you love most about what you do? Um, the relationships with my patients. So. We were, I was just seeing patients before I came here, and we were laughing, I, uh, one of the, the gents said to me, he said, you do realize something. I said, what? And he said, you're my longest relationship. And this is a guy I've taken care of for about 27 years. And it's true, it's, it's somebody who, we just had this long history, we've been through ups, downs right. of life together. So, you know, after a while, the medicine is the medicine, and I love it, and I like the new stuff, and interested in addiction and stem cells and all kinds of interesting new stuff, but really what's interesting are the people. And the way we pick medical students is really dumb because we pick them based on test scores and MCATs and we, you know, the best docs are empaths, are people who are empathetic and can connect with people and that's the way I run my show. And I have, I've hired staff that's exactly like me and we work, you were talking earlier about working in a team. So I don't call them my employees, these are my colleagues. Yeah. And it's amazing how well things work when you work with people that you love and respect and trust and you feel the same about your patients. It, you know, if you're watching this and you want to become a, a physician, what's the hardest thing today because it has changed a lot you know when 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 I went to school we're not, not that far apart in age but 
pretty much if you were going to be a doctor, you'd make a great living. I mean, you might not be the richest person, but you'd make a great living and, and you, you, you wouldn't have to worry about that. But with the way medicine is today, that, that's not always the case. Right. So what happened, and I won't get into the, the weeds here, but um, in the mid-90s, after Hillary Clinton, her health care plan didn't work out, very quietly, all these Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all the insurance companies were not-for-profit companies. Well, then they quietly went for-profit, and that's when all this messiness started. And they had to, you know, basically make earnings for shareholders. So before they started that, about 90 cents of every premium dollar you paid in 90 cents went to, for your medical care and 10% overhead. Well, now it's down to something like 68%, so basically 32%. Now, we didn't have computers back then, so their overhead couldn't have gone up. What they're doing is they're collecting premiums, denying claims, and making a lot of money on the backs of hardworking people. And I find that not really, you know, the way we should do this in this country. And I think um, healthcare should be a right, not a, pl a privilege. We're the only developed oh, country. Yeah. So, you know, rather than get on my soapbox about that, I just try to basically work around it for right now, and I do the best I can. And what we do is we just try to pay a lot of attention to people. But I know that in this area, Beverly Hills especially, there's this whole new, like, concierge kind of, you know, physician. Can you talk about that a little bit and explain what that is and yeah. what your feelings are? I, a concierge doc is sort of a new concept where the docs are getting so little money from the insurance companies that essentially they're charging some flat fee and they tell you, I'll get you in the same day, but everything else is sort of billed out, um, you know, just as usual. So I never really found that to be, in my opinion, you know, sort of ideal. So what I'm gonna do for next year is I'm gonna to go to what they call a subscription model. Essentially, you can think of it as a gym membership. You can come as many times as you want, annual physical, labs, x-rays, EKGs, everything's included, and this way, there's no barrier to care whatsoever. And I make it you know, affordable, but concierge, you know, again, you're paying for just the access. Right, well, that sounds amazing. Um, as a business, where do you see your growth? Um, it's right now, I had set my practice up when I was much younger. I moved to Los Angeles from Philly at age 32, and I'm 58. Gulp. Um, and, um, Dude, I'm 60. <laughs> you look great. Um, so um, what I want to do is retool my practice for people who are vaguely our age. Because what I have is I have a practice that's kind of geared toward 25 to say 50 or 55 year olds. They come in for an annual physical. I put up a fire, you know, bronchitis or a sinus problem once or twice a year, and that's about it. Well, people are starting, we're at the beginning of the bell curve where people are starting to get older, they're starting to get sicker, and I need to pay a lot more attention to them. And so I'm retooling with this sort of subscription practice next year where I'll really be able to focus and what I'm trying to do is optimize people's, what they're calling now their health span. And if I have a sec to explain that, medicine's been selling the wrong product. Agreed. For too many years. They've basically been selling longevity, how long you live. And that's not what people want. I don't want to live the last 20, 30 years of my life alive, but really sick and disabled. I would rather be super healthy, and then if I'm programmed genetically to die at 92, I drop off the cliff at age 92. Well, can you do that? And the answer is you can. And I, you can optimize people's, what they're calling now, health span, a long, healthy life, if you take care of all the details in real time. And we catch stuff early, and we treat aggressively. We just make sure that we're keeping up with each other. So I want to see people more, and I think I'm going to be able to do it. That's amazing. Gary, thank you so much My for pleasure. coming. And he's already told me he will be a mentor at Leap Week this week this year. So if you're coming to Leap as a student, you get to meet Gary live. If you need him as a doctor, you can find him how? DrCohan.com. It's C-O-H-A-N. Um, and uh, with that, Dr. Bill, over and out. <laughs>